great to see you on computer file in this sort of strange uh, remote manner. What, what is it you've got um, to talk to us about? There was a really nice story about uh, a real programmer who, who who did all sorts of tricks with things. A guy called Mel Kay who worked for the Royal McBee uh, Computer Company, and uh, he he was the ultimate real programmer. And uh, you, you can follow the story through, but uh, he did some outrageous things with uh, machines to just get them all to work. And th there's a number of things we could talk about, but. The one I wanted to start with was uh, the memory they had at the time, which was all based on drums, drum memory. I think it was kind of the first sort of memory they ever had. There was some stuff I think Dave Brailsford referred to where they actually had mercury delay lines, but they didn't last very long because uh, you know, mercury is not the easiest thing to work with. So these were sort of the very first commercial ways of s storing anything at all. So I don't think this video quality is quite good enough. We might have to sort of pick this up. Um, yeah, so let's pick it up when we've got everything all sorted, but it, it sounds like a fascinating story. Okay, yeah, well, I, uh, I've got some uh, examples that we can put together to uh, perhaps illustrate some of it, and uh, e even some broken hardware that's lying around, uh, including uh, this broken, broken disc here. A real programmer is somebody who's not afraid to use go-tos, not afraid to go in and change the binary code directly if that's what gets the job done. Probably doesn't use even high-level languages. They probably go straight down to the metal and they know the computers intimately. So this was uh, uh, brought into sharp contrast by an, a lovely story about uh, a guy named Mel who worked for a uh, Californian early computer manufacturer. This is in the late 1950s and uh, they had a new computer and one of the jobs that Mel had was to write a program to play pontoon or uh, 21 blackjack. So they could use this program when they took the computer to various shows or to customers. But this story actually, which we'll probably put a link to, uh, highlights quite a lot of interesting uh, items about computers. So certainly in the early days we didn't really even have memory. Well this is, predates me. So the early computers didn't have what we might view as conventional memory as sort of um, uh, magnetic cores or anything like that or uh, hard disks. The very earliest computers did a variety of things and quite a lot of their own things, but uh, fairly early on it was settled on something called drum mem memory. And that's what I'd like to talk about today as the sort of first introduction to this real programming and, and what you could do with that. To explain drum memory, I thought it was probably useful to start with something we know. So this, this is a hard disk, uh, an old one of mine that no longer works. So I thought if we have a look at it uh, and explain what's going on, so inside here there's a disk and there's a, there's a head that reads and writes from it. So let's go and have a look at that. So there are two important things about disks when you're trying to read from them. One is latency, which is while you wait for the particular bit of the disk you want to come under the read and write head. So you just have to wait for the disk to spin round. Also on disks there's a seek time, which is while you wait for the arm with the heads on it to move over to the bit of the disk you're going to eventually wait for the data to come under. So this is a hard disk drive. So I'm quite an old one now. Don't do this at home because it will destroy your disk. So this is the disk drive. It has here the heads which are floating over the disk. So this is the surface of the disk. I think you can see there are several platters there's not just one single disc, there's actually a stack of them. And each one of those has a different head. You can see this moves about slightly. So this is the uh, seek time. You've got to move the head backwards and forwards to come to the right cylinder, which is the three dimensional view downwards. And then you have the latency while you wait for the data to come around and come under the head, and then you can read it. Now, I think we can actually get this to fire up. It's, it's broken, so it doesn't actually work. But uh, let's see what we can do. We plug that in. This is the power supply. And I think if we switch it on. 
so we can see the disc is now spinning up. You can hear it making a noise. And then we can see the heads moving. This one's broken, so it doesn't actually uh, ever get there. But you can see how quickly the heads move. So this is what limits how quickly you can get data from the disc, is how quickly it can spin. So it's spinning pretty rapidly, so the, the data does come under the heads quite quickly. And then this thing has to jump around as quickly as it can to get to the right part of the disc. So between those two, that's what uh, limits your read speed of the disc. So the drum memory, I don't actually have a drum because they, uh, I think they went out of use finally in the 1970s, but they were uh, used from about the 19, late 1950s onwards, although I think they were invented in 1930. But this is what a dumb drum memory looks like. So it's just a drum with, um, just like a disc, it has magnetic stuff on it and there would be a, a read-write head here. Uh, so the drum would spin round. But the difference between this and disc memory is you had a fixed number of heads. You'd have heads that went all the way down, but uh, these would be positioned like this over the tracks and the density wouldn't be anything like on a hard disc today. So the drum would spin round like this. And what this means is you don't have any seek time. The heads are always positioned over the numbers or the, the tracks. So all the time you need is just the latency for it to spin round. And if you want the 24 for that to come under the head and then it can read it. But there are all sorts of tricks you can play with this. So if you're a real programmer, you know how long it takes for an instruction to to work. So let's suppose this 24 here was a, an add instruction or something like that and you just wanted to add 3 to a number, something like that. So the drum would come round, it would read that 24 and you would know because you were a real programmer and you knew intimately what your machine was capable of that an add instruction might take, I don't know, 10 milliseconds or something like that to complete. So if it took 10 milliseconds to complete, in 10 milliseconds, how much would the drum rotate? So what you could do if you were a really good programmer is say, well, I know 10 milliseconds is about a quarter of a rotation or something like that. I know the heads are going to be sort of hovering over this position, ready to read it. So I do the add, 10 milliseconds, I put my next instruction here and it's right ready to, to run there. If you just sort of put them anywhere on the the drum, then you might have to wait for it to rotate completely round to read it again. So by positioning these instructions on the drum, you could actually increase your program speed quite considerably because everything you needed would be waiting uh, waiting for you. So you, you read your 24 and you, your next one is going to be 30. And by the time you're ready for it, lo and behold, it's there under the uh, under the read head, ready to go. Another thing that Mel did was uh, uh, they, they had to print out stuff on a uh, basically a sort of typewriter like console and this could only output at a certain speed so it would print a you tell it to print a character A or something like that and it would print the A but it would take a few milliseconds to actually print the A and then be ready for the next one. So in this case, you want to use the drum to actually slow things down. So in, in Mel's case, he would print the A and he'd put his next uh, command, to maybe print a B or something, he'd put it uh, right the way around the other side of the, the drum. So it would pick up this and say, right, I'll print the A. And then it would have to spin all the way around here before it could pick up the next instruction, which was print B. And this he could work out was enough time for the printer to print the character, be ready for the next instruction. So uh, you could use this for a sort of delay loop. You, you Instead of uh, having to, uh, what's traditionally done for delay loops, which is just counting up to some number, you count to 100 or something like that, and that's it done. He didn't need any of that. He could just wait. He could say, well, I know exactly how long this is going to take to come round, so I shall just wait for that to come round and then uh, pick it out. And yet another thing he could do is um, if he wanted to add just arbitrary numbers to 
say you've got a variable and you wanted to add seven to it, what you could do is say, okay, uh, I'm going to write in my program uh, an add instruction and the number seven. But if you, uh, like he did, really knew what your computer is, uh, the instruction set is just a, a bunch of numbers. So we might have here 24 represents the instruction code for, a, for an add. But uh, a, a, a store instruction might be encoded as seven. So if he wanted to add um, seven to a number, then he'd look around his drum and say, well, where have I got a seven that's being used as a, as a load operation? Oh, it's over here. Actually, if I position that over here, this will be just perfectly positioned. So just by positioning all these things in a sort of matrix, uh, you can get all sorts of things. And of course, you've got lots of positions. You can move further down the drum. I haven't written them all in down here, but there's all sorts of places you can use to store them. So those are a couple of tricks that uh, he used. And uh, if uh, uh, we'll probably go on and discuss some of the other tricks that the early programmers could use to speed up or slow down or, or just get the maximum amount of uh, ability out of their computer because you're, you're really very limited in the amount of storage you've got and speed is everything at these points because these computers were not were running with transistors, they were still running with valves at this point. So every second counted. You only have to work out whether it's worth alerting the user if you find the key. So you know, you download the temporary exposure key, you perform the, the encryption, you generate the potential RPIs and you compare them with the ones you've seen. And if or if you want a more slightly comprehensible message, it's saying maybe you haven't applied a function to enough arguments.